another Lagrangian mechanics, Lagrangian multipliers, Lagrange multipliers to find the force of constraint. So this one's a pretty um, common problem that, that I see in textbooks and stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this. I'm actually going to solve it two ways. And the, the idea is to find the tension in the string. So what do we have here? I have a yo-yo, and I actually don't have a yo-yo because a yo-yo, which I actually do have a yo-yo right here. <laughs> a yo-yo, a yo uh, which was, as I understand it, originally a weapon, um, has uh, the string wrapped around a radius that's smaller than the yo-yo. So I want to do a disc, just a falling disc. Um, yeah, I heard it was a, a weapon because you could, like, throw it and then pull it back. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, there's all of these stories that are just kind of fun. So this is a disc. It has a radius R and a mass M. And I want to find the tension in the string as it falls. Okay. So with Lagrangian mechanics, we can pick our generalized coordinates to describe the situation. And in this case, we only need one degree of freedom, right? If I know why, and I know that the, sling, the string is wrapped around here, then I know this angle theta too, so I know how this thing rotates. So those two are connected. But if I want to find the tension of that connection, that is the force of constraint, then I need to under-constrain it. I need to under-represent uh, the, the degrees of freedom in the system. So, or over-represent, under-constrain. So I need, I need to have actually two degrees of freedom in this case. And then once we do that, the idea of Lagrangian mechanics, the, Lagrange, the Lagrangian is defined as the, the kinetic, in, I'm sorry, I'm losing my tongue here, the kinetic energy minus the potential, and then we have to define some equation of constraint that relates this variable and that variable, and we'll do that in a second. And then I get the two modified Euler Lagrange equations because I have two variables. The partial of L with respect to Y plus lambda, where that's some constraint parameter, partial of F with respect to Y equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to Y dot. So if you took this out, you get your normal Euler Lagrange equation, right? Okay, and then we have the same thing for theta. And then I can find the force of constraint in the y direction as lambda partial of f with respect to y. If I want to do it for the theta direction, it would be lambda partial of f with respect to theta. Okay, so our, I've already picked my variables here. I have y uh, is the distance from the top. Um, I guess I'm calling that a positive thing. And theta is the angle. So I'm going to start off with f. I'm going to write f of y theta is equal to y minus r theta equals zero. Because if this is rolling without slipping, then the distance this moves uh, based on the angle would be r theta, and that have to be the distance that y moves. And then what we want to do is get that as some function equal to zero. So I move, so I have y equals r theta, I subtract r theta from both sides, and I get that. Now we need to write down the kinetic energy and, that, and the potential. I don't think that's hard. Let's just do it all in one step. So I'm going to say L is the kinetic energy of the center of mass, one-half m y dot squared. That one's pretty easy, right, because this is one-dimensional. Plus, now I do have uh, the rotational motion of the disk. So it's going to be one-half i um, theta dot squared, right, one-half i omega squared. So i for a disk is one half m r squared. I'll put that in at the end. Um, that's if I have a, a solid disk. So that's the kinetic energy term. That's not so bad. And the potential energy term uh, is going to be minus uh, the potential. Potential is negative m g y. So it's going to be plus m g y because I have a minus right there. So and I, I'm calling y neg positive. So the potential energy of this is if this is y equals zero, then this would be negative m g y, and then I'd have to that plus. Cool? Okay, I'm going to start on a new paper. I'm going to write down this equation first. Okay, let's just write down my Lagrangian and my f. So f of r y theta is y minus r theta equals 0, and l is 1 half m y dot squared plus 1 half i theta dot squared plus m g y. Okay, so the first modified Euler Lagrange equation, I'm going to do the parts. Let's say the partial of L with respect to Y is equal to, I'm looking for Y's here. That's not a Y. 
no y, there's y. The partial of this respect to y is just going to be mg. Now let's do this partial of f with respect to y. That's pretty easy. It's going to be 1. Now let's do the partial of L with respect to y dot. And there's only one y dot. It's right there. I get m y dot. Now I'm going to take the derivative of that, the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to y dot. It's going to be m y double dot because the only thing that depends on time is y dot. Now I can put this all together as an equation. I get mg plus lambda times that, so it's just going to be lambda, is equal to m y double dot. That's an equation. Now let's do the same thing for theta. The partial of L with respect to theta. Up here, there is no theta in my L term, so that's equal to zero. The partial of f with respect to theta, negative r. Uh, the partial of L with respect to theta dot is going to be equal to I theta dot, right, because I bring down the power of 2. I have 2 o times 1 half. And then the time derivative d dt, the partial of L with respect to theta dot is going to be I theta double dot. I mean, I doesn't depend on time. Although, you know, that would be cool if you did like a, a thick string so that the the wrapping, I'm just thinking about stuff right now. You know, imagine that I have uh, even a cylinder, but as the string wraps around, it increases the radius of R so that as it unrolls, um, I want to do that problem now. I'm not going to do it right now. Okay, save this for the future. Okay, that'd be kind of cool. I guess you'd have to have a linear density to the string, too. Yeah, I'm thinking about that problem. This is the fun thing about doing basic problems, as you can see other problems. Okay, anyway, let's put this all together. 0 minus lambda r, right, because lambda times that is equal to i theta double dot. So now I have another equation, and I actually have three equations. I have three equations, kind of like three unknowns. I actually don't have uh, that because this, I have y double dot and theta double dot. So let's use this equation and say y equals r theta. If I take the derivative of both sides, I get y dot equals r theta dot. If I take the derivative again, I get y double dot equals r theta double dot. So that's good because now I can just eliminate theta double dot. I don't really want it anyway. Um, so that gives me the following two equations. Uh, mg plus lambda equals my double dot. And this one's going to be negative lambda r equals i r. No, I want to solve for, I'm sorry. I want to solve for theta double dot. So it's going to be theta double dot is y double dot over r. So this is going to be equal to uh, i times theta double dot, which is y double dot over r. OK, <clears throat> let's solve this for, I don't really, I want to find y double dot first. I mean, I think, do I want to do that? I wanted lambda. That's what I wanted. I want both. I want everything. OK, so let's, let's solve this for, um, I'm going to solve this for y double dot and plug it in up there. Now, I'm, I'm going to do theta y double dot first. So let's solve this for uh, lambda. Is it really negative? Yeah. Negative? Yeah, OK. So lambda is going to be equal to y double dot negative i over r squared. Now if I plug that in to this equation, I get a new sheet of paper. So I'm going to write my three equations up here before I forget. I have y double dot equals r theta double dot. I have mg plus lambda equals my double dot. And then I had, I solved that one already. I'm going to write this as uh, lambda equals negative y double dot i over r. 
Okay. So now if I substitute that in, this equation becomes mg minus i over r. That's r squared. No, that's r. Yeah, that's r squared. Yeah, that's r squared. i over r squared y double dot equals m y double dot. So now let's add this term to both sides. I get mg equals uh, y double dot times m plus i over r squared. Notice that this, if I put in my expression for i, one half m r squared, this has units of mass. So I can add it to that. So that's a good thing. And then it, all the units work out in that case. So now let's just solve for y double dot. y double dot is going to be equal to mg over m plus i over r squared. That's the acceleration. So now let's just check, right? If if the mass of the, if there was no, if the radius was zero, if the radius of the string was zero, then it should have, uh, or if there's no rotational term, which is the same thing, if this term goes away, then y double dot would be equal to g. And remember, I'm calling downward positive. So that's a free fall, and that is good. That is what I would expect. As i, or this term right here, increases, the acceleration gets slower. The, the greater the moment of inertia of that sphere, or disk, the lower the acceleration. Okay, so that seems legit. And it does have the right units. This is mass, that's mass, that's acceleration, so, so that's good. Okay, so now we can find uh, lambda, right? So I know lambda right here. Lambda is going to be equal to this thing. So it's going to be mg uh, times m plus i over r squared. All of that times um, this, i over r squared minus um, okay, so we need we could do a little simplification here, couldn't we? I can divide and multiply. Hmm. Let's I could factor that out. Yeah. I could factor that out. So let's say this is going to be equal to. I'm going to leave it. Let's leave it. I mean, it's it's correct, right? It's correct. It it may not be in the best terms. So now what I want to do is to. Um, do this another way. I want to do non-Lagrangian mechanics and find this. So let's say that I have this. Here's my bad yo-yo, because it's a, it's a cylinder. And I have uh, the forces on this are going to be the gravitational force, mg, and then a tension force, t, like that. And they're not lined up. So let's write down. Uh, a net force in the y equation, y direction force equation, and I'm going to write down a torque equation. So I can say this, F net y is going to be m y double dot. And now I'm calling this the y direction. I don't really care. We'll figure it out. So then what forces are acting in the y direction? Well, that's, that's going to be t minus mg. So there's an equation right there. I don't know t. Let me go back over here. This is the force of constraint, right? I just remember FCR is lambda times the partial of F with respect to R, which is just lambda. Okay. Now I don't know T, so I, and I don't know Y double dot. Now let's write down the torque equation. So if I look at this torque about this point O, torque net O, I'm going to use it in simple terms. It's going to be equal to I times alpha, that's the angular momentum principle in a way. Uh, I'm writing the scalar version of it. And in this case, um, the torque is going to be equal to the tension times R, and that's going to be equal to I alpha, which is theta double dot. Theta double dot is the acceleration, angular acceleration. And then if it's rolling without slipping, I can say that same thing, Y double dot equals R theta double dot, right? That has to be true. So theta double dot is equal to Y double dot over R. And I put that in, I get the following equation, TR. That's the torque, right? Because that's the, the, 
distance r is equal to i y double dot over r. And, and I'm, I essentially have the same equation, right? This is the same equations that I had before, except I have t and y double dot instead of lambda. Um, so, I mean, should I solve it? No, because it's the same thing. But we get the same thing. And, you know, the, the funny thing is this is easier, right? This looks simpler. Um, but the other one is a great practice for uh, Lagrange multipliers because uh, we know the answer. We can calculate it. And then we can do it for things that are more complicated. I'm trying to think right now if the disk, if the string is heavy and wrapped around multiple times, uh, which way would be easier. I'm thinking Lagrange multipliers because I like that way better. But who knows? Okay. I don't know if I'm going to do that wrap around disk problem. But you can do it. It'd be fun.